And on the line with us is Congressman Ro Khanna taking your calls for the hour. His website, Khanna.house.gov. You can tweet him at Rep. Ro Khanna, R-O-K-H-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. He is the vice chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. And Congressman, let's pick up some phone calls, okay? Sounds great. All righty. Joan in Nashville, Tennessee. You're on the air with Congressman Khanna. Joan? Is this for Jen? Yeah, yes. I, Joan, yeah, you're on the air. Um, just let me say I'm 74 years old, and the state of the country right now is new for whites, so therefore it's news, and it's a crisis. African Americans live, have lived through the same state of tension and violence ever since we've been in this country. So now it's a problem because it's negatively affecting whites. If racism is to be erased, it can only be done by whites. Black people cannot do it for whites. Only whites can. And I'm not saying that whites who define themselves as non-racist should confront the racists in a violent way, but they need to call them out each and every time they make statements like we see and have heard that these racists make. And even if it means alienating your friends and family, it's something that you have to do. And whites alienate their friends and families all the time when they take uh, an opposite political position. So why not on racism? You know, if a black person encounters a white person who respects them as a human being, then that black person is more likely to generalize that experience to all whites. Whereas if a white experiences a positive situation with a black person, they will not then generalize that positive experience to all black people. And you just, I mean, it's, it's, it's just pervasive. Now you see on TV, during the commercials and in the different sitcoms and other shows, where you have different variations of families. It includes uh, different ethnicities, that's something that America could have been doing all along, you know, since the invention of TV, but now they're just now doing it. And, you know, racism is something that was created by whites. It's perpetuated by whites. And I can understand why, because they think that it benefits them. And that's, you know, I can understand that. But, you know, when they talk about playing the race card, the race card is never out of play. It's always on the table. May I? And, may, you know, go ahead. No, I, I, I'm sorry, Joan. Finish your thought, and then I wanted to add a comment, and we'll toss it to Congressman Connor. No, no, you go ahead. I'm... Okay, the, 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 the point I wanted to make is that, I, and I just learned this over the weekend, the last Democratic president who was elected with a majority of the white vote, in other words, the last Democratic president for whom more than 50% of whites voted, was Lyndon Johnson in 1964. In 1965, he signed the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, and never again did a majority of whites vote for any Democrat, up till this day. Never has happened again. And, you know, of course, Richard Nixon went in and said, okay, we'll scoop up, you know, all the white people in the South and turn them into Republicans and, and like that. And uh, it is far more pervasive. You are absolutely right, Joan, in my opinion, and it's far more per pervasive, I think, than even most white people realize. Joni, you done? Should we toss it to the congressman? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say something about Lyndon Johnson. I mean, you know, especially black people talk a lot about Lincoln, but he had his reasons for doing what he did, which was to save the Union. He didn't necessarily care about the freedom of black people. Yep. But with Lyndon Johnson, and, and I put him even over FDR because the programs that FDR instituted, black people were not able to benefit from in the very beginning. 
And even now, because our lifespan is shorter than whites, I mean, when you think about Social Security. Mm. But with Lyndon Johnson, he did the morally decent thing, and he knew the political cost when he did it, but he did it anyway. To me, that is a true leader. Amen. Congressman Connie, that, that, you're, 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 yeah. th thank you, Joan. Thank you for the call. Uh, Congressman Connie, your thoughts? Well, I appreciate uh, Joan's perspective, and obviously it comes from uh, a life experience and great wisdom. And I think it's important what she said about uh, FDR. I, I was down south with Jim Clyburn, and we were talking about FDR and the new rights, and I was uh, enthusiastic about uh, FDR's philosophy. And Jim Clyburn said to me, you realize, Ro, uh, African Americans didn't get to participate in most of the programs of the New Deal and made uh, uh, Jones' point that it was really Lyndon Johnson who uh, opened up uh, those programs. So uh, I would take away two things. One is to realize when we're talking about uh, the New Deal or government programs, we have to be mindful of uh, the country's history of exclusion of uh, African Americans and the minority population and, and really uh, take that to heart going forward. And two, uh, Joan reminded me of Tanezi Coates' article about uh, uh, Trump being a, a white president, and he make, he's making the point that uh, uh, African Americans have been dealing with a lot of these issues for many years, but it's uh, now that uh, the issues are affecting uh, white America that there is a greater uh, attention, and it, we should just continue to be mindful of the uh, racism and stereotypes that afflict this community. And uh, I think there was a, a, some ho naive hope when Obama was elected that uh, we had moved past uh, some of this, at least in my generation, and uh, it's been a chilling reminder that uh, many of these problems uh, persist and we still have a lot of work to do. Amen.